Yo guys, what's going on? I'm Tim Kelly. This is The Real Sports Talk. I'm joined today, as always, by my co-host Justin Godsey of The Nation Sports Blog. And this is The Real Sports Talk and Nation Sports Blog presents the 30 Clubs, 30 Previews MLB Special. Justin, today we are on to a team that, regardless of the record, they have one of the biggest fan bases in the entire MLB, they are one of the most popular teams. They always sell out every game, and they have the oldest stadium in the MLB that isn't Fenway Park, and that is the Chicago Cubs coming off of a 61-101 and season. Dale Swaim is their manager. Justin, Cubs, no matter what, they're going to have interest. Absolutely. There are a lot of teams hitting up this team for one exact player right now currently. Um, that's Carlos Marmol. Yes, if you guys go back earlier in the offseason, Carlos Marmol had had a bunch of teams going after him. And, you know, the Angels were involved. There was a possible deal going down with Carlos Marmol going over to the Angels. And you know what? This team overall, we're, we're, we'll get more in-depth in it, but this team overall has one of the biggest fan bases. And you know what? I think this team, somewhere down the line, has what it takes to get back in the race of being, becoming a playoff team. They just got to get more production out of the players. That's yeah. the big and last year they began the experiment with Theo Epstein as the team's president. They have Jed Hoyer as a GM. I like that direction. I like Dale Swaim as a manager. Ultimately, though, they were 61-101 and last year. And that wasn't last place last year. But with the Houston Astros out of the division this year, having moved to the American League West, that actually would be last place this year. So the Cubs are in a situation where they're in a division that... It's really a pretty solid division with the exception of them. So there's a very realistic possibility that they could finish in last place again. I think the key for them is to continue to see production out of a few guys. The biggest being Starlin Castro, Anthony Rizzo, Jeff Samarja. If they can see those three guys have the production that they had last year and continue to build on what they began last year, then you see the, the a bright future with this team. They have some pieces that I think other teams are interested in and guys like Alfonso Soriano, Carlos Marmol. So there is some bright there are some bright spots for the Chicago Cubs team. Justin in the offseason they made a couple moves. They brought in Edwin Jackson. What else did they do this offseason? So you you said Edwin Jackson that I really like that. This team just signifies that they're gonna be well, trying to improve on their pitching rotation. Now hitting wise, they got Deanna Navarro who's been bounced around from team to team throughout his MLB career with the Rays, you know, last year he was with the Dodgers and the Reds last year, and now he's coming over to the Cubs, gonna be serving as the backup to Wellington Castillo as their catcher. Now going into the infield, you know, they they brought in a couple of guys on minor on minor league contracts, you know, they brought in Brent Lillibridge, um Edward Meissano, um Brian Bogusevic, who can play the infield and the outfield, so he's coming over from the Houston Astros. Um, they got Scott Harrison. You know, Scott Harrison coming off a very phenomenal year with the New York Mets. Uh, they, they're getting a full season with Nate Shearholtz, so we'll just hope that you know what they what they brought in can really help. A, a, produce well with this team in 2013. Now they do have a couple contracts that they, they're trying to get off of their hands. The biggest would be Alfonso Soriano's. The unfortunate part about that, the deal that was an 8 year $138 million deal that a lot of teams were interested in Alfonso Soriano who was once coming off of a 40-40 season with the Washington Nationals in their opening season. Uh, it just it, it's never really worked out, but as the deal begins to wane down, there's less years on it. We begin to see that teams are willing to take on a little bit of the money. The Cubs are still going to have to eat most, but we'll get to Alfonso Soriano in a minute. We're going to begin behind the plate with the Cubs, and that is their starting catcher, Wellington Castillo. Castillo last year spent some time in the major leagues at both, and also at the Double A and Triple A level at double or at the MLB level, I should say. He hit 265 with five home runs, 22 RBIs. I think he's a young catcher. He's going to bring the production hitting wise, uh, probably about 10 or 12 home runs this year. And he's getting the option for the first time in his career at the major league level to be the number one catcher. Playing full time with the Chicago Cubs, Wellington Castillo is going to be getting that time. And you know you cannot go wrong with him. This is a guy who plays great defensive baseball. He has a good bat. You know, brings a really solid average out of him. And you cannot go wrong with Wellington Castillo right now. No, you can't go wrong with him. Now, the, the guy behind him has been one of the most puzzling MLB careers that I've ever seen, and that's Deonor Navarro, a guy who was a top prospect of the Yankees. 
He's been with the Dodgers. He was an all-star with the Rays. Then back to the Dodgers, to the Reds. It's just he's had a couple seasons where he's looked like the player that they thought he was going to be. And ultimately, it's never really worked out. He got a one-year deal with the Cubs to be their backup catcher. It's worth just under $2 million. Navarro can give you six or seven home runs. That's what he's going to bring. He's going to bring a guy that has been... Uh, in some big situations, he was with the Rays in 2008 when they made a run to the World Series. So I think he brings some veteran leadership as that backup catcher. And that's important to Wellington Castillo, who's a young catcher. Over at first base, Anthony Rizzo is really one of the brightest young guys in the MLB right now. In 87 games last year at the MLB level, hit 285, 15 home runs, 48 RBIs, stole three bases, and... At the AAA level, in only 70 games, hit 23 home runs after hitting 342. He tore it up in 2011. He hit 331 with 26 home runs. This guy has MLB 30 to 35 home run type power, and he's really one of the. If you've watched his film at the minor leagues level, with which both Justin and I have done, he's one of the brightest, most fun young guys to watch. And the Cubs may very well finally have found a star to build around. Absolutely. I know when the Cubs had, you know, Brian LaHare, he's no longer with the team anymore. And a lot of people were running high on him. But, you know, Anthony Russo, when he came over from the San Diego Padres, which they, I think they traded Kashner and... Um, you know, Andrew Anthony Rizzo. This guy is a promising first baseman in the major league, coming in, going into the future, and currently right now, because this is a guy like Tim said. We saw, I saw his film down the minor league film, uh, this minor league film with the Tucson Padres and the Iowa Cubs. This guy has hit 26 to 23 home runs in 2012. 23 home runs, 2011, 26 home runs. This guy has the bat to get up to about the 30 home run range. And you know what? That's what this team needs. They really need that power bat in that lineup. And you got it in Anthony Rizzo. Yeah, in first base, in terms of the All Star game, was once a very crowded position because you had. Albert Pujols, you had Prince Fielder, you had Ryan Howard in his prime, you had Lance Berkman, and really none of those guys the last couple years, two of them in Fielder and Pujols moved to the American League, Howard's had injury problems, Berkman got older, moved to the American League, and uh, he's back in the American League now after a couple years in the National League. And ultimately, the the first base position in terms of being an all-star is open. And, and just don't be surprised if Anthony Rizzo is an all-star at first base this season because I think he's going to come onto the scene and make a big impact right away. At second base, Darwin Barney's going to be a starter. Last year, stole six bags, hit 254, seven home runs, 44 RBIs. I like his glove a lot and played pretty much every game last season for the Chicago Cubs, Justin. I'm a huge fan of Darwin Barney. Not only do you get great production out of him with his bat, you know, even though last year was, you know, his average went down from the season prime 2011, this guy still brings a productive bat to this team. You know, on average, he'll get you at best seven home runs as we saw last year. But you know what? What you're getting out of him is a highlight reel of a player. Great defensive ability, great defensive playing ability. And you know what? Darwin Barney really surprised me last year. And you know what? You, you want to look out for this guy on this team coming down into the future. The one thing that I would say is that this team does not have a ton of depth in this infield. They're relying on Rizzo to pretty much play every game at first base, Barney to play every game at second, and over at shortstop, Starlin Castro, who has been an all-star and a very important piece to this team over the last few years, he's pretty much going to play every game at shortstop. Last year, declined a little bit with the average, went from hitting 307 to 283, but hit four more home runs than in 2011, hitting 14 home runs, got his RBIs up to 78, and stole a career-high 25 bases. It's just it's extremely hard to find very good shortstop talent in the MLB. And what people don't realize is that Starlin Castro is still only 23 years old. He has so much potential. He is going to be a piece that if the Cubs decide to keep him, he does have a tremendous trade value. But long term, if they're able to keep him over a long term basis, I think Starlin Castro is going to be around for the turnaround of this Cubs franchise because. Uh, he's really one of the pieces on this team that I look at and say that the Cubs need to keep him because he, he does it all. He has a good glove. He has a great bat. He can steal bases. I just I like Stalin Castro a lot. Absolutely. If this team has got to keep one player on this team for the rest of their you know for the 
for a while. You can you have to stick with Starlin Castro. No, this guy has been phenomenal ever since day one with the team when he made his debut in 2010. In 2010, he really impressed a lot of us in 125 games. You know, this guy batted 300. And then every single year from there, this guy has improved countless and countless times. And you know what? Starlin Castro has just been a phenomenal baseball player. You know, he does bring it year in and year out. You know, 14 home runs last year. Very phenomenal as that went up last year. But you know what? Starlin Castro, this guy can hit up to 311 to, to 320, and that oh, wow, that's a little bit too high. But around the 311 area, that's where he where he can actually be hitting. So you know, when you go into this season for Starlin Castro, you know he has got to bring that average up a little bit. But other than that, he's a phenomenal baseball player with great talent and an amazing future ahead of him. At third base, Ian Stewart is going to be the starter. Stewart last year hit 201 with five home runs, 17 RBIs. I think that the thing always with Ian Stewart, he has a ton of potential power-wise. The thing that Ian Stewart does not bring to the table is he has never been able to be consistent with the average. He strikes out probably a little bit more than you want, but he will be your starter over at third base, and then backing him up at third base will be Luis Valbuena, who's going to get some looks really all over the infield because this team just does not have a ton of depth. In 90 games, Valbuena hit 219 last year, four home runs, 28 RBIs. Again, another guy that traditionally has not brought a great average at the MLB level. Ian Stewart, when he was with the Chicago Cubs, I've always had like this feeling that he's just waiting to have a breakout year. And you know what? You know we got. You know, would you see a breakout year in 2009 with the Rockies? I wouldn't expect it, but his, his average was a little too low. But when he come over to the Chicago Cubs, I was really excited for him to have a whole fresh start with a whole new team. And you know what? I, we still have not seen it yet. You know, so he's going into his second year with the team, and what he has a. He has a lot of uh, weight on his shoulders right now because, you know what, he just doesn't produce way down the line in the season. So, you know what, I could still see this third baseman role still up in the air. Now, for Luis Valabuena, he was recently sent down to the minor league camp. When you go down to a bench piece, you got Josh Vitters, a guy who's been down on the team's you know, farm system. He was with the Iowa Cubs last year. His promising power bat, 71 home runs, 68 RBIs, and a 304 batting average. You bring that up to the major league level, you know, you're you're going to see you know, a solid uh, third baseman in, in, all, in a decent infield. He can also be playing over at first base. So, you know, you know Rizzo does not have to, just in case on an off day, Rizzo has a uh, decent backup for him. Yeah, and I think that Josh Vitters probably is the long-term third baseman. I think Ian Sir will get most of the looks this year. But you're right, he brought had some good power in the minor leagues last year. Really had just a very good overall season, hitting 304, 70 RBI. So a solid season for Vitters. He is someone that will get some looks in the MLB level as well, as well I should say. In left field, Alfonso Soriano is going to be your man. Soriano last year, he had 32 home runs. He had 262, six home or six stolen bases, 108 RBIs. It sounds good. But, I mean, I can just tell you from watching Alfonso Soriano, he has lost so much bat speed over the last couple years. He drives way more balls to right field than he used to. I can, I can say that from watching him on TV, from watching him in person, because I've done both. And, and the bottom line is that the numbers might look all right, but he, he just he has never been the player that the Cubs expected him to be, except for the first year or two that he was there. And since then... He is a liability in the outfield. He always has been. He, he's been a liability pretty much at every position he's ever played. But left field, he's just a, a strange fielder with the crow hop and everything that he does before every play. He's not reliable in the outfield. And I think that the Cubs' best bet is to move on from Alfonso Soriano when they get the option. There's teams like the Tampa Bay Rays that could be interested. The Yankees could be interested if... Um, you know, the, the injuries continue to pile up. They could be interested in a reunion with Alfonso Soriano. The, again, the Cubs are going to have to pick up a lot of the money, but I think that their best bet is to give a younger guy an option and a chance out in left field rather than sticking with someone that they know in a few years is not going to be there, is not really producing at the level that they need him to do now. Yeah, I agree. You pretty much summed that up really well, Tim. But, you know, year in and year out, you know, Alfonso Soriano, he does bring come up to the plate, and he does give you those home runs. Last year, 32 home runs, 26 RBIs a year in 2011. But you know what, Tim? I, I have to say, I think the team that if, 
if the Cubs have the opportunity to trade them, I think it's going to come this year at the trade deadline. And the team that really comes to my mind is the team that you said, is that, and that is the New York Yankees, a team that has been just killed with injuries this offseason. They really need that depth in that team. So I can really see that going down. I think if Soriano has a productive year, that's something that you you want out of them every year in and year out. But you know what? I think this is the year that you know at the deadline that Alfonso Soriano is going to get traded. Yeah, I do think he will be traded this year. If not sooner, he'll be traded at the de deadline or maybe even past the deadline if a team decides that whether an outfielder gets injured, whether they need a DH, I think that would be his best suited role would be being a DH in the American League. They could maybe put together a waiver deal. But I think at the very least, Alfonso Soriano will not be wearing a Cubs uniform at the end of this year. Dave Sapple will be the backup. Sapple last year at the AAA level at 266 with seven home runs and stole 15 bases at the MLB level. In 26 games, hit 275 with two home runs and eight RBIs. There's not a ton to go off of. I think he's going to be a hitter this year that's going to hit you around 260, give you five to seven home runs. I mean, th that, that's kind of their problem is they don't have another great option in left field behind Alfonso Soriano. In center field, David DeJesus, who... I don't even know what to say about David DeJesus' career because he's had some really good years, but then he, he's just never really been able to consistently put together good year after good year. Look at what he did in 2010. He was having a great year, hitting 318, five home runs, had stolen three bases. I believe he was an all-star, and then he got injured, spent, ended up spending a season in Oakland that went mediocre, and then spent a season last year with the Cubs, or his first season with the Cubs, and he had 263, 9 home runs, 50 RBIs, stole 7 bases in 15 attempts. I just think he, he's most productive when he has that average up at a high level, and he has not been able to ever do that at a consistent enough level for me to really like David DeJesus as an outfielder that much. Now, personally, I'm a huge fan of David DeJesus, but you know what, Tim, you are correct here. You know, it's just off and on, off and on, those good years, bad years, good years, and bad years. Well, you know, with the average, is, it's, it's pretty solid year in and year out for him. But, you know, it's just the injuries, injuries, injuries that always affect this guy from having a solid full season. But, you know, for David DeJesus, he's going to be playing in Chicago. I, I see a good vibe for him staying in Chicago as their long-term center fielder. You know, he's still, he's getting a little bit up there in age. But, you know what, David DeJesus, if he stays healthy, he does give you a productive bat. And, you know what, that's what you really need from him right now. Now, backing him up in center field, and David Azus is a piece that if the Cubs decided that Soriano wasn't able to be moved and they wanted to get a younger piece back, maybe David Jesus is someone that teams would have interest in as well because what it's going to take some work to move Alfonso Soriano. And teams might decide that that just isn't worth it. If they want someone who has better ability to field in the outfield, DeJesus can play both center and right field, so that might be more valuable. But Brett Jackson will be the backup. Jackson in 44 games last year hit 175. Zero or four home runs, nine RBIs. So he has some pop, but overall off the bench, he was not a great average hitter. I think that that's it's tough to go off of that at the AAA level. Hit 256 with 15 home runs and 47 RBIs. Stole nearly 30 bases. That's what he can bring to the team. Is he a great contact hitter off of the bench? No, but he has the speed on the base pass. He can be a good pinch runner at times for this team. And then he also does bring some occasional pop. I just wouldn't expect him to come off the bench and be a guy that hits you for a great average because he's not a very consistent contact hitter. Now, right field is one of the more interesting positions for this team because they do have a couple options. I think they'll go end up going with the platoon situation. And that is with Nate Shearholtz and Scott Harrison. We'll begin with Shearholtz, who last year spent time with both the Phillies and the San Francisco Giants. He was acquired by the Phillies as part of the Hunter Pence trade because he was disappointed with his playing time in San Francisco. In San Francisco at 251 with 5 home runs, 16 RBIs with the Phillies and hit 273 with 1 home run and 5 RBIs. His problem with the Phillies was he started off alright but then he got hurt and was just never able to turn it around, finish the season at the AAA Lehigh Valley level. So uh, he ended up getting non-tendered by the Phillies and the Cubs picked him up. He's someone that has always had a, a lot of potential, was a very bright piece in the minor leagues, was a piece that uh, I think a lot of people expected could come up to the MLB level and hit 
280, 290, hit 15 home runs, and he never really has turned out to be that. The thing is, though, he's still under age 30, and I think some teams do look at Nate Shearholtz as a piece that could be a late bloomer. Absolutely. I, Nate Shearholtz, this is a guy who you guys know I'm a San Francisco Giants fan. You know, looking at this guy's film from 2005 to 2007, year in and year out, this guy gets you about 15, on average, about 15 home runs a year. And you know what, that's what this team really needs him. He really needs to get more power in his swing because during his time with San Francisco, you know, he, he played full seasons and, you know, he, he was mainly used as a team's bench role. But, you know, Nate Shearholtz, he's going to be coming over to the Cubs. He's going to be in, in a platoon situation like Tim said where he's going to be going, um, going to be sharing time with Scott Harrison who's still a great outfielder. But, you know, Nate Shearholtz, what he's going to bring to the plate for you is, you know, a, a decent, you know, 280, maybe 270 average, somewhere in that alley. You know, last year was just a total down year for him. You know, San Francisco did get a good deal on Hunter Pence, who still wants to stay with the team. But going over to the to the Cubs on side of things, near Sheerholtz is still a promising guy. Plays great defensive baseball. Now, when you look at his def uh, looking at his backup, I don't know why I said defensive, but looking at his backup and Scott Harrison. You know, last year with the Mets, you know, it was a really surprising year. So many teams this offseason were really looking at him, looking to get more depth on him, because that's what uh, Scott Harrison does bring. And that also brings up the, you know, situation with Alfonso Soriano. If, he t if Alfonso Soriano is traded at the deadline and they do get a prospect back from in the Soriano trade, you know, that's going to be a work in progress. But then you can also put Scott Harrison over in left field, which he also had experience with the San Diego Padres back in the day. So, you know what, I think Scott Harrison is, is going to be, you know, the bench role for now, but if Soriano is traded, you're going to be seeing Scott Harrison play as that team's everyday left fielder. Yeah, and I agree with that. I think that, I think Shearholtz and Harrison will flip-flop, be a platoon. I think Harrison will play against lefties, and Shearholtz, unless Shearholtz absolutely tears it up, he'll play against righties. But the thing that Scott Harrison brings, the Cubs got a great deal on him. Two years, only $5 million they had to pay. He had 20 home runs last year. He can play numerous different positions in the outfield. I mean, don't get me wrong. Scott Harrison's not an all-star. He's not anything great. But there's pieces that are so similar to him, like Josh Willingham, that teams are paying through the nose to try and get. The Twins are paying him a pretty decent amount of money and the Cubs get a similar piece in Scott Harrison that they only are paying two and a half million over the next two years he had 20 home runs last year I would expect closer to 15 or 17 this year but either way that's worth two and a half million dollars he has again the ability to play left and right so I, I like the move of bringing in Scott Harrison a lot that rounds out their lineup now looking over at their rotation Jeff Samarja is going to be this team's ace. Last year, Samarja in 175 innings went 9 and 13 with a 3.81 ERA. That was coming off a season two years ago where he had a 9 or a 270 to 97 ERA, but that was before he had made the transition back into being a full-time starter. So it's difficult to go off that. But in his first year, really as a full-time starter, Samarja had a solid year, not great, and. To have an ace with a 381 ERA, it kind of shows where the Cubs are right now. You know, the Cubs right now, if it, if it was at this situation right now, if one of their players was healthy, being Matt Garza is their number two guy, you would see Jeff Samarja at number two. But, you know, when Matt, Matt Garza is currently out with injury, you know, they, they have to go with Jeff Samarja at this point. So, you know, I think Samarja is going to be at the top of the rotation for a little while until Matt Garza gets back to full health. But, you know, what, Jeff Samarja has been in both the bullpen. It's been, it's also been seen some time in the pitching rotation. You know what, Jeff? Jeff Samarja is not going to wow you a whole lot, but you know what? This guy is an is a um, inning eater, and we saw that a couple of times throughout his career where he was pitching down in the minor leagues at the AAA Iowa Cubs level, 111 innings and 174 last year. So you know what? He's just up there to be that inning eater type of pitcher. Yeah, I, I think that Jeff Samarja is a fine pitcher, and uh, in the innings eater part you're right about, you just don't want that as your ace. Now, Matt Garza, you mentioned the injury. I'm not exactly sure when Matt Garza is going to be coming back. Are you, Justin? Um, I heard it was just a couple of weeks, but you know what? It could be going into the season. You know, it's just still up in the air at this point. Yeah, and, and teams are never going to be honest with you at the beginning of the season. When people have injuries, they'll say, oh, he'll be back in time to start the season, and then a week before the season, it'll be he's going to be out for the first month. So Matt Garza had an extremely... Uh, I, I wouldn't say disappointing year last year because 
Injuries did catch up to him late in the season, and he was a guy that had had ERAs close to four for a lot of his career with the Rays. But in 2011, he had a 10 and 10 record with a 3.32 ERA, had two complete games, and he really looked like a guy who was becoming one of the better pitchers in the NL Central. And the Cubs should have capitalized then and moved him because that's when he had the highest value. Instead, they waited another year with him. He went five and seven with a 3.91. One ERA, and really, it just it comes off as the bottom line is that in 2009 and 2010, when you were getting some or uh, Garza with a 3.91 and a 3.95 ERA, that was the real Matt Garza, and that 2011 with the 3.32 ERA, it was kind of a fluke. Yeah, recapping on that injury, Tim, he has a lat issue, a lat issue right now. He's going to be out for the first month of the season, and that's going to be a, a big loss for the Cubs right now. But Matt Garza, when he is healthy, he is a guy who is also, you know, a great overall pitcher. You know, we have not been seeing it during his time with the Chicago Cubs. You know, a lot of teams have been barking on the Cubs' door asking for a trade. They want to have Matt Garza because Matt Garza gives a lot of depth to any team in the major leagues. You know, he does. He's still young, has great velocity in his fastball, and I understand why a lot of teams are going after because like I said great depth for this guy but you know when this guy is healthy he does get you a solid you know six or seven innings in and you know what other than that he's a great pitcher now the Cubs went out big and tried to make a move by signing Edwin Jackson this offseason they gave him a four-year 52 million dollar deal and quite honestly, I, I just I, I have no idea why you would do this. This is a guy who's bounced around from team to team, whether it was with the Angels, the Dodgers, the Rays, the Tigers, the Diamondbacks, the White Sox, the St. Louis Cardinals, and then last year the Washington Nationals. He's a good pitcher. He'll give you innings. He's a solid middle-of-the-rotation guy. But is he worth a four-year, $52 million deal? I mean, if he had been worth a four-year deal, then he wouldn't have been moved that many times over the course of just five or six seasons. He's a solid pitcher, but I, I, I really struggle to give a guy $52 million who had an ERA of over four last year in an NL lease that really was not that great of a hitting division because the Nationals were the best hitting team probably in that division and then the Braves were they, they had a good lineup they weren't great the Phillies were missing half their lineup for half this season last year the Marlins had John Carlos Stanton and Jose Reyes but they weren't a very good team overall and then the Mets weren't a great hitting team so if he had a 403 in the National League East then I just I don't think he was worth this amount of money it's not that he's a bad number three guy but the Cubs are trying to get out of some of these bad contracts with guys like Alfonso Soriano. And it just feels like they made this move just to kind of remind the fan base, yeah, we care. But it, it just it wasn't a smart move for the long-term future of this team. Absolutely. I, I was really, really surprised that the Cubs dished out that much money for Edwin Jackson, like Tim said, bouncing around from organization from organization every single year. Now, last year with the Nationals, I felt really that he felt really at home with the Nationals. Even though with that 10 and 11 record with the ERA up in the four area, I can still I would still say why didn't the Nationals go out and resign? Even though the team is, you know, the bottom of the rotation is still up in the air right now for the team. But you know, I, Edwin Jackson he's going to be moving on, and he's looking for more. He's going to be looking for. You know, getting up there in the rotation. You know, with the time with the Nationals, he's been always in that middle inning type of type of guy. But you know, he's going to be coming over to the Cubs. He's going to be serving as the team's number two guy. And you know, he's going to be barking down to number three once Garza is back to full health. But you know, Edwin Jackson, he is a good pitcher without a doubt. You know, has a great fastball. He has a he has a crazy changeup ball. And you know what? He, that's what he's mainly going to be doing. He's just going to be there, and he's going to be that inning eater as well, kind of like Jeff Samarja will have. No, 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 I think he's a little bit better of an inning eater than Jeff Samarja because I think he has more potential. He is a guy that can go out there and throw a lot of pitches for you. I remember when he threw that perfect game with the Arizona Diamondbacks, he threw nearly 150 pitches. So he, he's, he is a guy that will give you a lot of innings. I just I don't think he was worth the amount of money that they ended up giving him. Scott Baker is going to be your number four starter last year. Did not pitch at the MLB level because of some injuries, but he did pitch in 2000. 11 with the Minnesota Twins going 8 and 6 with a 3.14 ERA and I like this move of the Cubs picking him up because even if he doesn't do that good which was probably his best season he gave the Twins an ERA in not quite the mid fours the 4.30s 4.40s and they're not paying him a ton so I I, I like the move he is uh, struggling to get 
to uh, pitching at the beginning of the year because of some injuries, still trying to make a comeback this year. But when he is back and if he is able to get healthy this year, I think Scott Baker is a nice piece for this team. Yeah, Scott Baker, without, well, during his time with the Twins, including when the, I think it was that 2009 or 2008 year, both of those years when the Twins were still in playoff contention, Scott Baker played out of his mind. And Scott Baker, overall, if he's when he's healthy, he's a great pitcher. Now, if he's not, I could still I can see him being demoted down to the AAA level. And there's a guy on the roster that you guys should really look out for that could be possibly a guy in the rotation somewhere down the line, and that's going to be Travis Wood. You really want to look out for a guy like that who brings a really good a, a good fastball, and you also, it's also that a depth type of issue with, you know, this pitching rotation, but overall, Travis Wood could be uh, trying to get his way up to the major league level, and I think if you're looking at this rotation, I think Scott Baker could be that guy who is going to be, you know, having the, the overall down year in this rotation. It could be demoted, and that's when you can get Travis Wood that call. Yeah, Travis Wood has shown some bright signs when he was with the Cincinnati Reds, and then ultimately didn't do a ton last year, but I like Travis Wood. I could see him in the rotation at some point this year. Rounding out the rotation for the Cubs is going to be Scott Feldman, who spent his entire career in Texas as both a starter and a reliever. Last year was a reliever for most of the season, did make, or was a starter for most of the season, I should say. Made 21 starts, made 8 appearances out of the bullpen, 123 total innings, going 6-11 and with a 5.09 ERA. I think this move, no matter what happens, whether he works out as a starter, if he doesn't work out as a starter, then they can put him in the bullpen. So I do like that, bringing in Scott Feldman. And then, Justin, to round it out, we're just going to look at their closer, and that is Carlos Marmol. Marmol, again, drew interest, was traded this offseason. And the thing about the trade was that it ultimately did fall through because of some technical reasons, but it was done. And... I think that a change of scenery for Carlos Marmol wouldn't be the worst thing. I think he is someone that has always had a ton of potential. I still think his best role is when he's a, as a setup man, but he does have the ability to be a closer. I know you and I were talking about maybe a team like the Tigers could have interest in Marmol. So I think unless he's blowing things up and having a, an incredible season, I think he will be traded by the Cubs at the trade deadline this year. I think the Cubs are too set in on Carlos Marmol right now, and that's the reason why, you know, the deal with Dan Heron, I, I think, fell through because, you know, Dan Heron was also injured as well. But, you know, the Cubs still have, you know, a lot of interest in Carlos Marmol, and that's probably the main reason why they don't, they don't want to trade him. I know there's still teams knocking on their door like the Tigers, just trying to, you know, trying to work out a deal that would send Carlos Marmol. But, you know, this team is too, you know, in for Carlos Marmol. They're just waiting for him to get back on track on a good year and get back to the way that he was in 2010. You know what, this guy still has a, a good future ahead of him, and let's just hope that 2013 is the year to get back on track. So, Justin, all this being said, again, the Cubs lose the Astros in the NL Central, so the pressure's on them because everyone else in this division was either above 500 last year in the case of the Reds, Cardinals, or Brewers, or has a lot of potential in the case of the Pirates. So I don't think that there's too many people that are going to tell you the Cubs aren't going to finish in last place. They won 61 games last year. I see about 63 or 64 wins this year. All that being said, though, with guys like Anthony Rizzo, Starlin Castro, the foundation is built, and now it's a matter of continuing to rebuild a, a minor league system that was diminished for this team, bringing up the right pieces, making smarter signings in Edwin Jackson, hopefully getting a good year out of Matt Garza so you can make a trade there, make a trade with Alfonso Soriano, and begin to rebuild this team and build towards a brighter future. Absolutely, I, I agree. When it comes to the Cubs in this division, you know, you got the Reds, you got the Pirates are going to be dominating, dominating the top along with the Cardinals, but then you have the bottom couple of teams, that's going to be the Cubs and the Brewers. I think you're really going to see a battle there between the two. I still don't think the Cubs have like the full the full pieces to become, you know, a top contender in this team, but you know, in this league, I should say, or division. But you know, somewhere down the line, I think the Cubs are just going to be, once the, a big player is going to be on the market, just they're gonna go out there and put the money on the table and say I'm gonna go and go grab it. You know, one of the top players in baseball, and they are gonna go out and sign him. But you know what? For right now, and right now is right now. And this Cub, I have him in fifth place. I, I this team has good pieces and all, but you know what? I still think that the Brewers 
They still have productive pieces over there, and I think the Cubs are going to finish in last place. But Cubs fans, do not worry. Somewhere down the line, your team could be back up in the race of becoming a, a division champion as well. Yeah, and they have a guy in Theo I've seen who did it with the Red Sox. It's going to be a different type of deal now because he's taking them from the ground up and trying to build. And if he continues to make signings like Edwin Jackson, then I'm not sure it's going to work. But ultimately, we'll see what Theo Epstein does. That is the Chicago Cubs 2013 season preview. Justin, we're looking at that Los Angeles Dodgers, one of the most exciting teams in the MLB next, a team that on paper looks like a dream team. So we'll get to them next. Until then, I'm Tim Kelly along with Justin Godsey. Thank you for tuning in. Please share this video, like, comment, whatever you're going to do. Thank you. We'll see you later.